All right, so in the last several lectures, we've talked about the lambda calculus, and we've talked about the rewrite rules for the lambda calculus, the different kinds of uh, reduction rules, the reduction relation, and the ways that we can reduce the lambda calculus down to normal form. But we haven't talked too much about how we actually implement the lambda calculus in an efficient way, or how we build an interpreter for the lambda calculus. And so today, we're actually going to design a metacircular interpreter for the lambda calculus that includes closures, which is going to be an important thing that kind of stands in for what would otherwise be a very inefficient implementation of substitution. If we implement substitution in kind of a direct way, so every time we have to perform, for example, an application at a call site, we actually textually uh, substitute variables, that's going to require order in work at every call site. Now, there's a reason that we started by building a metacircular interpreter for the Ifarith language, and it's because the same methodology is basically going to be the one that we're going to follow here, and that's that we're going to build an interpreter that's a recursive function that walks over the syntax, recursively calls itself to get some value, and then uses the values for uh, sub-expressions and combines them based on whatever the form is to produce some result. All right, so in our implementation today, I'm gonna to describe how we're going to implement the lambda calculus plus uh, numbers and also a single built-in plus. And this is just because uh, whenever I look at implementations of lambda calculus uh, sort of on paper, it was always hard for me to understand those just because you couldn't write any kind of real examples in them. So being able to just include even one or two built-ins is kind of nice. And then throughout the course, we'll see how we can generalize this to handling even larger and larger fragments of a language. All right, so following our convention that we follow in class, so far, we can represent expressions that we're going to be the, defining the meaning of using this expert-ha huh, data type. All right, so we're just defining a data type that says anything that satisfies this predicate is going to return true, and then everything else is going to return false. All right, so numbers are an expression. Uh, if we have a tagged list that begins with a plus, followed by two sub-expressions, E0 and E1. That's an expression. Uh, just a bare symbol by itself, which is gonna be a variable, that's an expression. Uh, if we have a tagged lambda with a specific sublist containing a single variable X, that's a symbol, uh, followed by an expression, then that is also an expression. Uh, this is the body of the lambda. And then otherwise, last, we have a call site from some E0 applied to some argument E1. And that's also going to be a, an expression. All right, and nothing else is an expression. All right, and now our job in the rest of this lecture is to define a function called interp, which is going to take an expression as input and is going to give us its corresponding value as a result, as its output. And so first we need to define the set of values of our language, right? Because what are values? Values are the kinds of things that you can get after you actually perform the evaluation on some expression. They're the results of computation. And so like ifarith, our language is going to include numbers. Those were the only values in ifarith. But unlike ifarith, we're also going to have lambdas, except in our language, we're going to represent lambdas a little bit differently. You might ask yourself, how do you represent a lambda as a value? All right, so let's look at the following example to kind of motivate ourselves. Let's say that we want to evaluate this entire application, lambda x3 applied to 4. Well, in doing that, we're going to have to evaluate this sub-expression, lambda x3. Now, sort of older languages like C and C++ kind of get past this by saying, you can really only call a function here if you've already syntactically named it. Now there's an exception, you can always use a function pointer for example, and that's kind of tantamount to this approach in some ways, uh, but for not for other reasons that I could explain later. But here, the main problem that crops up is, how do you evaluate this lambda down to a value? How do you represent that value? So when you actually interpret this lambda x3, what's its value going to be as the output of your interpreter? This is a problem we didn't have to face before in Ifarith because our values were always just numbers, and we could just represent those in Racket very nicely. So one option would be to evaluate the lambda to just the text of the expression itself, all right? So you could evaluate just lambda x3 to just lambda x3. And this does give us basically a textual reduction semantics. And this is exactly the kind of semantics that we studied in the last few lectures as we try to define the initial kind of uh, forays into formalizing programming languages. But it turns out, especially when we level up to the lambda calculus where you can have variables and functions, that uh, 
In lieu of advanced representations like uh, graph reductions in the STG machine, for example, used in Haskell, if you follow the kind of primitive uh, strategy that we've talked about so far in class, uh, explicit substitution would be very slow. And so there are a variety of ways to deal with that. For example, you can use De Bruyne indices and things like that. But here, we're going to focus on one particular solution, which is to use closures, all right? So we would like each computation step to be basically constant time. Whenever we're processing uh, some piece of the computation, we'd like each little piece, each sub-expression we're traversing to basically be constant time because we'd like the evaluation of an expression to be kind of, you know, uh, no larger than the actual computational complexity induced by the evaluation of the expression itself. We don't want to be adding additional computational complexity on top of the actual algorithmic complexity exhibited by the program, right? And so that's what we would get if we used an explicit substitution kind of semantics because we'd have to be doing additional work to actually perform these substitutions. And so instead, what we're going to do, our machine, by which I really just mean our interpreter, is going to use this thing called a closure to perform substitution lazily. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna track an environment in which variables are going to be looked up. And so whenever we return a lambda as a result, we're also going to return in the environment that that lambda was created in. Because that environment will be able to have as its variables, all the variables that are free variables in scope at the point where we're returning a lambda. All right, so we can see some examples of this in a few minutes, but let's just say a closure is going to be represented as maybe a tagged list where we say it's a closure with some lambda x and then some sub-expression e right here, followed by some environment, which we're going to represent as a hash in our implementation. I'll get to that in a few minutes. All right, so thus, if we take this kind of stance, we have two kinds of values in this machine up here. So remember, we're trying to define the semantics of this language right here, which has got the lambda calculus and it's got numbers. And so we know we have numbers and our semantics. We're gonna find out it could actually be possible to model numbers directly using lambdas. We're gonna see an encoding that allows us to do that in a few more classes. However, another thing that we could do is just model them directly. And so in this case, we're gonna say, there are just two types of values there are numbers in, and then there are closures. And then these closures actually capture some environments in them. So we need to include what is the environment as well. And the environment is going to be a mapping from variables to these values. So the environments and uh, the uh, values are a data type that's kind of mutually recursive, right? To know what an environment is, we have to know what a value is. To know what a value is, we have to know what an environment is. But this is no really conceptually challenging problem. It's just something for us to keep in mind as we think about how this stuff works. Uh, and now as a side note, I will say Haskell actually uses the STG machine to enable uh, sort of lazy graph reduction in this really nice way that I don't really have uh, context or time to kind of go into in this class. But uh, there is a better solution to actually interpreting uh, lazy languages that I would point you at if you're interested to look into as well. Uh, if you'd like to read through these sets of notes and summarize them for me, I'm happy to give you one or two participation points for it as well. Okay, so... Let's decide how we can handle each of these different cases in our interpreter. All right, and we're just gonna sketch it out conceptually here before we then go over and implement it actually in the, uh, in the code, which we'll jump over in a few minutes. So numbers, if I say interpret some number in, I'm also, I have to, by the way, when I design my interpreter, I have to also take not just the input expression that I'm gonna look at, right? That's what we could do back in our if or if interpreter. We're able to define an interpretation function that just took a single expression and then returned a number, right? But here, when we're gonna use closures, we also always need to be tracking an environment. And so every call to interp is actually going to include an environment, which in our case, it's gonna be a hash ref. We can formalize it in mathematics as a partial function. I'm gonna be a little bit uh, inspecific about that here. But when we actually instantiate a call to interp, it would look like interp and then some number in here and then there's some environment. Well, to evaluate a number, we don't need the environment because we're not looking at any variables. We can just say the answer is just in, all right? So numbers are a kind of value in the codomain of our, or in the sort of domain of our values or our language. And so that's really kind of fine. We can leave that there. What about variable lookup? Well, we keep our variables in this mapping, which is this environment. So at every point in time, the environment is gonna hold a mapping from variables to values. 
And then at call sites where we actually apply lambdas, we're going to have to update those environments. And so we're doing this lookup or, or sort of substitution for this lambdas in kind of a lazy way. And so for variable lookup, what we're going to do to interpret X in some given environment, assuming the environment is a hash, is we're just going to return hash ref of that environment on X, where X is the variable name. Okay, now what about interpreting plus of E0, E1? All right, maybe I even want to write a quasi quote here. That's going to be even closer to what the code is actually going to look like. Okay, so how do we interpret a plus? Well, first we need to evaluate the sub-expressions E0 and E1, and we need to include an environment here. And so what we're going to say is, if interp E0 ENV interprets to N0, and if interp E1 ENV interprets to N1, and then if N prime equals N0 plus N1, then our entire result of E0 plus E1 in the environment ENV evaluates to this result in prime. All right, so these are just sort of plain English rules or really natural deduction style rules. I'm just not writing them formally with the bars, but you could always think of there sort of being a bar right here if you want to construe this as the kind of formal natural deduction style. Well, if all of these things hold, then this in deduction right here is going to hold. And that's how you interpret a plus. So plus is kind of a recursive case. And it makes sense because syntactically, plus is sort of a recursive piece of syntax, right? In the same way that both of these things are sort of base cases for the syntax. There's no sub-expression for a number. There's no sub-expression for a uh, variable. But there is a sub-expression for uh, the plus case. And there will be uh, for the lambda case as well. But in the lambda case, because we want to return just a lambda right here, we don't actually want to have to perform the substitution. In our regular rules for the lambda calculus, we would actually have to perform the substitution to return the value of a lambda if we were doing a textual reduction semantics. Here, what we're going to do is say, when you want to interpret a lambda, hand back a closure. And this is actually the same exact thing as what happens in a racket if you type a lambda. You'll get back a, a pound procedure. And that is Racket's way of saying that there's a closure. Now, you can't deeply inspect it. You can't look at the actual text. You can't look at the free variables. It's kind of an opaque thing to you in Racket. However, that is Racket's way of signaling to you that you're dealing with, at runtime, a closure rather than just some piece of syntax. And so this is what our interpretation of this lambda is going to be. And remember, we can just return a closure here in the same way that we can return the value in right here because Closures are a kind of value in our interpreter now. We're going to code this up as a value hop predicate in a few seconds as well. Now, what about the apply case? And this is actually the really interesting one, which is basically, how do you do a call and a return? Okay, well, for the first thing you have to do in the case of a, an apply of E0 to E1, let's say. The first thing that you have to do is you have to take E0 and you have to take the environment that you're currently looking at and you have to evaluate that down to a closure, all right? Because to interpret E0 applied to E1, there has to eventually be something in this E0 position that reduces to a closure. Let's say it was something that reduced to a number, for example. Well, then this would just be invalid. You can't apply a number to a function. And in Racket, there actually is more work that's done to make sure that when you actually do an apply, well, if you handle something that's not a closure, you have to propagate that back up and actually raise it as an error. Now, that's not something we're modeling properly in, in our semantics here. We're just not going to give a definition to that case by saying we're assuming that E0 is going to evaluate to some closure with some lambda x, some body E, and that closure is going to have some ENV plus, which is potentially going to be different than the environment. And in fact, in general, it probably will be different than this environment that we're currently looking at here. Now, we want to evaluate the body of this lambda right here after we've substituted this X for whatever this argument E1 evaluates to. And so what we do is we're going to say interpret E1 with the current environment that we're starting in all the way down to its argument value v. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the stored environment from this closure. Because remember, this closure's environment goes along with the body of this lambda. The body of this lambda was capturing, it captured an environment that was generated at the point where 
we had sort of uh, returned that lambda and that's to retain, again, lexical scope, right? And so we need to use this environment that gives the free variables in E their definition, but we need to extend it with a binding for X. And that's going to, uh, we're gonna use hash set to do that. We're gonna take this env plus, we're gonna set x to be v, which is the value we got by computing the, uh, the value of the argument expression. And we're gonna use that to build a new environment, which we then call interp on. This time we're gonna interpret this body with this updated hash. Now this hash set is basically constant time. It's using a hash array map to try. So yeah, it's basically a constant time data structure. And then we're not inducing a lot of overhead here for doing the substitution that we typically would be doing in a textual reduction style semantics. Now, if all of this call where we evaluate the body evaluates down to V prime, then we're allowed to say that the entire application evaluates down to V prime. All right. Now, how can we take all these rules and actually implement them as a racket function? So what we're going to do, and just to summarize what we've seen so far in lecture, we have the recursive function in terp, and it's going to take two arguments. It's going to take an expression E, we're going to match on that expression. The base case is our lambdas, which are going to return closures, numbers, which is just going to return themselves, and variables, which get looked up in the environment, another parameter of the interp function. And then there are two recursive cases. There's a plus, which is going to evaluate each of the sub-expressions and then combine them with plus. And then there's apply, which evaluates the function position down to a closure, actually updates the environment, updating the, the you know, sort of formal parameter X captured by the closure for whatever the value of that argument expression was, and then runs the body of the lambda. All right, so let's see how we can actually implement this in racket code right now. All right, so let's just recap again. Uh, our expressions are going to be categorized by expert, huh? We're gonna say match E. If it's a number, huh? Then that's an expression. If it's a plus of two sub-expressions, that's an expression. If it's a symbol, that's a variable, that's an expression. If it's a lambda that then has this sublist enclosing a single variable that's a symbol X, followed by a lambda body, which is this sub-expression E, that's also an expression. Then it could be an apply, and that consists of two expressions where we've got one function expression applied to one argument expression right here. All right, so these are our expressions. And then just to recap, these are our values. So values can either be numbers or they can be tagged closures consisting of an expression. In practice, this is actually gonna be a lambda, so we might actually be able to write lambda x and then some expression here. And then an environment, which is going to be the environment that goes along with this lambda. All right, so whenever that matches, it's true. And then everything else is false. And I should be doing that for these cases too. All right. Now environments are going to be mappings from symbols to values. And that's what this little hash C thing means. It's a little hash combinator. It's a contract combinator that says uh, it's true whenever it's a mapping from a symbol, huh, to a value, huh? So that's what our environments are going to be. And then interp, which is the function that we're gonna be defining, is going to take two expressions, or sorry, no, it's gonna take two arguments. It's gonna take an expression and an environment. So it's gonna take an expression as its first argument, an environment as its second argument, and it's gonna return a value as its return value. All right, and so now we're just gonna define a match case on our expression. We're gonna say if it's a number, so this was the first rule, if it's a number, then just return the number in. If it's a symbol, then look up in the environment the value for the corresponding variable x. What if it's a lambda? Well, then we just return a closure of this expression and the environment. We need to keep the lambda because we need to remember what the argument for the lambda is. So there would be a variety of ways to represent this, but this is kind of the way that I like to do it. Okay, so if it's a plus, then we're going to call interp E0 ENV. That's gonna give us some value V0. Then we need to evaluate interp E1 ENV. That's gonna give us a value V1. And then we're gonna add them together. 
we get our result. And then finally, and this is the most interesting case, this is the real heart of our today's lecture, we've got an application, E0 to E1. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate E0 down to a closure to apply. All right, so that's gonna be our closure. We're gonna assume that that's a closure. If it's not, we're gonna raise an error. This would be the case where we try to do something like apply a number. Now, assuming it's a closure, it's got some lambda x with some e body associated with that, and then it's got some environment that it's capturing. And it's very important that we remember to evaluate the body in the context of this environment rather than this environment right here. If you use this environment right here, you're actually gonna get what's called dynamic scoping. And this is in fact what happened in the original implementation of Lisp. In fact, you can read a book where the creator of, uh, or there's an, an article uh, by McCarthy where he talks about the fact that he didn't uh, really read over one of Church's papers onto the next page and accidentally implemented dynamic scoping in Lisp because of exactly this kind of a problem. And it was later solved by what were called fun args uh, in Lisp but I'm here calling closures. It's essentially the same thing. All right, so we're matching this closure to apply. We're saying there's some lambda x with an e body and some updated environment. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate this e body in a new environment where we've hash set environment plus so that x is the interpretation of whatever e1 is within this environment. All right, and then running a program is simply just calling this interp function with the expression we want to evaluate in the context of the empty environment. All right, so let's look at an example here. All right, I've got this big complex expression where I've got lambda y, lambda x, y, x, this whole thing applied to lambda z, z plus five. All right, so I'm applying this to this. And this is going to result in a lambda x, y, x, where y is implicitly captured and bound to this lambda right here. And that's going to use our closure representation. We're then going to apply this lambda to four, which is gonna instantiate x to four and call this lambda, ultimately with z as an argument for four, where the entire result is then four plus five, that's then gonna use our rule for plus and should return nine. So let's see what happens. We run it and we get nine. All right, so now we'll move on to talking about project three. This is a scheme interpreter project. Uh, it's really gonna be a culminating part of the course in terms of actually having you starting to implement programming languages. The last three projects in the course, so really the bulk of the actual writing of code you're doing in the course, will actually be implementing pieces of programming languages. It'll be an interpreter here It'll be a compiler in the next project. And finally, it'll be a type checker in the last project. And so uh, try to read the whole readme. There's a lot of information here. I'm not gonna go through all of it in the video. I will say basically, you're gonna be implementing in the same style that we just did uh, previously in this lecture. You're gonna be implementing a metacircular interpreter for this programming language right here. All right, so it's gonna be the Lambda calculus, except you can have uh, any fixed arity of lambdas it's gonna have let binding, which we haven't talked about. Uh, well, we have talked about here, we haven't implemented it. Uh, that's an extension to the Lambda calculus. Uh, it's gonna have begin statements. It's gonna have ifs, and it's gonna have set bang. So set bang is an interesting one. Uh, we'll discuss how that works in a few seconds. Uh, it's gonna have built-in operators. However, built-in operators are not part of the environment. And so they're not truly first class in the same way that they are in Racket. And this is actually a little bit of a simplification of the project from previous years. Uh, we made some things in this project a little bit harder, some things a little bit easier. And one of the things we made a little bit easier is that uh, you don't have to have truly first class built-in operators. And I'll show an example of that in a few seconds. And because we can have arbitrary fixed argument lambdas, we can also have arbitrary fixed arity application of several expressions. All right, and then we have symbols or variables. We have numbers, and then we have uh, just Boolean constants. And the Boolean constants are true and false. All right, so uh, this is a pretty sizable subset of scheme. It turns out that even though it doesn't apparently have recursion, you actually can get recursion using the U combinator, which is a trick that we'll talk about over the next few uh, lectures. And so if you kind of think through how this example works, it applies this function to itself, which is then gonna generate this lambda that then can take x 
if x is equal to zero, it will just return one. Otherwise, it will actually make a new copy of itself, which it then calls. That's kind of the self-application trick. And so you can get nice little loops like this. So you can actually do a, a pretty uh, nice sizable subset of programming in this language. All right, looks like that's all good. So let's, for example, you need to be able to implement let's. You need to be uh, able to have arbitrary numbers of binders here. Uh, be careful not to implement the let star semantics. You need to be careful to make sure you've just got the let semantics. We might have some tests that cover that. Begin executes several things in a row. So for example, this begin implements a set bang here followed by a set bang here. And now at the end of this whole uh, you know chain of events, X ends up being two. Uh, argument order happens left to right. Okay, so there's two functions that you're gonna implement, run and interp. Run, which is kind of stubbed out for you already, is gonna take an expression and it's gonna return a value. Interp is going to take three arguments. It's gonna take an expression, an environment, and it's going to take a store. And this is to implement set bang. All right, so the way that you're gonna implement set bang is that you're going to keep everything at the end of the day in a store. So instead of the environment, being a mapping from variables to values like it was previously in this lecture, now it's going to be a mapping from variables to addresses. And then the store is going to be a mapping from addresses to values. So you could say here, store, store equals adder to value. All right, now the return value of this interpret function is an eval result, which is not a value. So previously, for example, in the previous part of the lecture, we returned a value. But now we're actually going to return more than just a value. We're going to return this eval result thing, which is going to have a tagged list of result, value, and store. And the reason we need to return a store is because we might have possibly updated the store. We don't necessarily update the store, but in some cases we will, in the case when we're actually making a set bang change to the store. And so because we're not allowed to use set bang in the implementation in our class, and in fact, even if we could, it wouldn't directly help you implement set bang here. So it's a little bit beside the point. However, to implement set bang, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna pass an input store and we're going to return an output store. And then our environment is going to map variables to addresses, and those addresses are going to be the domain of the store, the keys of the store, which are then going to ultimately store the values. And so to implement setBang, you're going to just be able to update the corresponding address for a given variable within the store to update its value. But the upshot of that is to get that behavior the interpreter has to return not just the value that it returns, like we did previously in lecture. You're also going to have to return the store, which might be the same as the input store if you didn't update it. In fact, in most of the cases, it will. All right, so one of the things that you're going to have to implement here is you're going to have to implement closures. So we did that previously in the lecture. You're also going to have to implement set bang. I'll let you read the section on it here, but these kinds of expressions need to work. You can also see, for example, here's an example where you can sort of see how setBang breaks uh, reasoning about the code in a purely functional way. So I'll let you read that as well. Okay, so how do you actually implement setBang? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make, like I said before, the environment is going to indirect variables to be addresses, and then those addresses are going to be the domain of the store. Now, how do we actually generate these addresses? Well, we want them always to be unique. At every point when we perform an application of a closure, what we're going to do is we're going to pull out the formal arguments for that closure. We're going to create new addresses fresh to the store that the store doesn't know anything about because of course we don't want to stomp over values that are currently in the store. So we want to generate new values in the store for new keys in the store, which we're going to call new addresses, bind those in the environment and then update the store. All right. So this, the environment is going to track variables. In our case, we're not going to look up values by just looking at the environment. We're actually first going to use the environment to get us the address in the store. And then we're going to reference hash ref through the store with that address that we get by looking up through the environment. All right.
All right, so there are some more notes here. I'll let you read through all of these. Uh, it's all kind of important. I would really encourage you to read everything and uh, read me, and then also let me know if you have any questions about it. Uh, let's go actually look at the project now. So let's go look at what we have to implement. So uh, I have stubbed out, well, so for our number case, we can just return the number and we can return the store and everything that we return from our interpreter has to be one of these tagged result expressions. Okay, what about looking up a variable? All right, well, I'm happy to give you this answer. If you're watching the video, it's gonna be result and then we're gonna do hash ref of the environment with the variable x, just like we did in the previous lecture, like just like we did a few minutes ago, except now that's just going to give us an address. All right, so we can look, all right, so we can use hash ref to get the address through the environment, and then we can use hash ref again using that address that we just looked up from the environment to index into the store and get us the result. And now we also need to return the store we don't need to change the store because just looking up in a value from the environment and then through the store doesn't actually change the store itself. All right. And now your job is to handle the rest of them. So how do we handle lambdas? Well, it could just be a closure, kind of like we did earlier in the lecture. Yeah, it's just going to be a closure of this expr with the current environment, except we can't just return that value. We also have to return the store that we didn't update. All right. Now, that's basically how we start doing the project. I'm going to let you start fleshing it out. One thing that I will say is that you should really pay attention to handling this case right here, the application case, because this is kind of the hard one. And it's also the interesting one. One way that I would start it is by thinking, what if you just had this single case right here? where you had a single application or a single, uh, a single argument. How could you handle just this case? Well, I would say first evaluate EF, next evaluate ERG, then match EF as a closure, then create a new address to put the value for the argument update the environment and the store and call interp. So that's what I would say there. And I would start by using the code that I gave earlier in the lecture. All right, it's not going to be exactly the same because you're also going to need to add addresses and stores, but it'll be substantively fairly similar. All right, well, good luck on project P3. I'm really excited to see everyone start on this and I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's questions. All right, so talk to you in class and have a great rest of your spring break. Thank you.